Well, good morning, everybody. We need to spend a little bit of time at the beginning of this video focusing on potential tropical cyclone number nine, and that's what you're looking at here. This is an infrared satellite loop. Just to get you oriented, this would be the Yucatan Peninsula. You can see Cuba here. This would be Jamaica. And what we've got in this, what we call mesoscale floater, that's where we train the satellite on a very specific area and get an image every single minute, is we're looking at the very intense convection that is on its eastern side. Now, tropical or potential tropical cyclone number nine has yet to develop a uh, a very well-defined uh, center, and we don't expect it to do that until later today once it gets through the channel. So the channel we're talking about is this one here. This would be the Yucatan Channel, and then it gets into what we call the loop current. That was the very warm water that exists in this current that runs just like this uh, through the Yucatan Channel. That's where the ocean temperatures are about 90 degrees right now and very supportive of rapid intensification of the storm system. What will be important to watch is how this system interacts with a low that is trying to dig its way into the central United States. So let me take you back here into the overnight. Let's actually start off yesterday. We can see some, um, you know, some storms, cloud cover, rain in this area from the leftover of our most recent system. That gets us all the way into parts of the northeast as well. But I want you to watch the cloud field coming out of central Saskatchewan into parts of eastern Montana. What you're seeing here is the upper level wind driving this trough that's developing in this area. And so as that wind comes down and sets up and starts to spin right here, it's going to be critical on determining where um, Helene ends up going. That'll be the name this it gets later on today. And then how it works its way through Georgia, flooding against the Appalachian Mountains, and then makes a turn to curl around the upper level low that'll be sitting here. I'll show you this more detail in just a few moments. So you can see even in the overnight, which is now infrared imagery, this is just a black and white scale though, that uh, that's, that flow kind of dipping down here is gonna get cut off. And you say, well, how do I know that? Well, when it becomes more north-south oriented rather than west to east, what you end up getting is that meridional flow tends to just pinch off lows and they just sit and spin. We kind of break through up here and just get the air to flow over the top of it. And that's what's gonna be very critical to the distribution of the rainfall from this system. Now, early this morning as the sun was rising, I'm actually right underneath this storm here. That's where I live in Illinois. And uh, we've had a lot of lightning and thunder this morning. In fact, my power's flickered on and off a few times, so I hope I don't lose it here as I'm recording for you. But a broader cloud shield, we'll take a look at what this is going to do in just a few minutes, okay? So here is our newest forecast. And what we're watching here, if we just go forward in time, is that deep convection creating a center, getting somewhere through the Yucatan Channel by the time we get into uh, tomorrow. And so this is where we expect things to be on Wednesday. And then very quickly throughout Wednesday, this is going to move its way toward Florida. Now, in yesterday's forecast runs, we saw a bit more of a trend toward the east with this system. And I was quite concerned about that because that put the Big Bend very much into play here for a landfall, very similar to in 2018 where Hurricane Michael hit. And I was worried about the storm surge getting into parts of Tampa. This morning's model runs, I, I would have to just say, maybe took this back a little bit farther to the west. What will be important to assess when we figure out, the, you know, once the storm gets named and gets through the channel, is how large it's going to be. But at this point, I can't rule out from Destin to Pensacola all the way to the Big Bend as a potential uh, spot for, for making landfall. Again, we're just looking at the ensemble members here from four different modeling suites. Just like we talked about yesterday, we do expect this to interact with the upper level low that cuts underneath it. This will give us that Fujiwara effect we talked about, bringing the tropical low around the edge. And this is going to be spreading quite a bit of heavy precipitation throughout this region uh, as well. We'll take a look at those precip totals in just a few moments here. But concerned about the strength of this system, remember when we look at our models to try to determine the strength, our big global models like the CMC and the GFS and the UK Met, these are not models that we rely on to determine the strength of a hurricane. They just aren't. What we tend to rely on are the hurricane specific models and the National Hurricane Center, which is right now at a category two strength storm. It just is important to note that we do have a pretty high end on this possibly becoming a major hurricane at category three. Some of the forecast models are taking up to category four and yesterday some of those models even had it up to cat five, which means we just have the ingredients in place to make this a pretty potent storm system. And what you're looking at here is the wind speed in nautical miles per hour. So if you wanna do a quick calculation, just multiply that by 1.15 and you have miles per hour. But for all intents and purposes, we can just look at this and go, all right, we're looking at 100 to 130 mile an hour winds um, onshore 
at some point, I think in Florida, if you look at the peak gusts currently being forecast, all right? This will push a lot of water. And that is why right now we see on the right-hand side of this storm, on the right-hand side of its track, again, if we, if we assume that it's coming in somewhere like this, the greatest storm surge will be here, 10 to 15 feet. Tampa Bay could be five to eight feet. Yesterday, we saw a couple of forecast models taking it up to 10 feet there as well. But it appears it'll be throughout the Big Bend that we're gonna get our greatest storm surge from this particular system. Now, if you're on the western side of this, there is the likelihood that once the center of circulation is on land, we will begin to draw water out of these bays because the flow will be coming out of the north and be quite strong uh, coming out of some of these bays and inlets that are along this part of the Florida Panhandle. I do wanna show you one very specific hurricane model, and we're gonna look at the um, HAFSA model. And when I show you this animation from Weatherbell, it is going to, the box is going to stay right centered on the hurricane. So the, the box moves with the hurricane, not with the geography. So what you've got here is there's the Yucatan Peninsula. This is um, Cuba. And here's the center of circulation. We are in tomorrow afternoon. So we very strong evidence this will be a, a rapidly developing hurricane at that point. Now you can see Florida coming into view here, the storm system very symmetric, likely rapidly intensifying. It is interesting to see that on the eastern side we're expecting a not just a stronger wind field but maybe um, a, 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 a where the deeper convection could be on this. I think there's still some drier air on the west it's going to have to deal with. But again, the wind field is always stronger on the eastern side of a northward moving hurricane because this is where the forward motion or the translation of the hurricane adds to its rotation. Now the HAFS has been very consistent with taking the center of the hurricane right here, right toward this region in Florida. But a broad area of impacts throughout all of these coastal towns and cities. And again, this would put Tampa uh, in the greater risk of storm surge out of this particular system. Now we know that as soon as hurricanes like this do hit land, especially this part of Florida versus the Everglades, we tend to get a pretty quick de-intensification of the system, but that may last. We may see hurricane force winds that stretch into southern Georgia. As we play this forward, this would have been, let's make sure we get the time here, that's 0 Z on Friday. So we're talking about 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening on Friday, excuse me, on Thursday when this comes through. And then we see it right now still producing tropical storm force winds well into parts of Georgia. Now, if you're in Alabama, the winds will be out of the north. We're not expecting them to be as strong. It seems as though the best evidence we've got now is that this system is going to track farther into Georgia before it starts to make its turn. And what that does is that puts more of Georgia, more of South Carolina, and more of North Carolina into the main flooding threat out of this system. But we're expecting these very strong winds to go through a corridor that looks something like this, where we could have tropical storm force winds pretty far to the north and hurricane force winds that maybe make it this far inland based on some current analysis. So I wanna be very careful with this. What's hurricane force? That's where we're up there around 74 miles an hour. Maybe that's a little too far inland to suggest we're gonna get that, but gusts could easily be in the 60 to 70 mile an hour range in this area. So we just need to be very aware of what this system is capable of doing and how quickly it's gonna intensify. We have a lot of evidence, despite the fact that it's not even formed yet. I mean, it's still a potential tropical cyclone, number nine. It's not even Helene, it's not even a hurricane yet, but there's a lot of evidence that this is gonna be the case for where this storm system's gonna go. Now, I'm gonna keep playing the model for you because as it goes through Georgia, you now saw it make this turn, right? So it's coming through here. Now we're back into this part, very close to Atlanta. And this is gonna eventually move into Eastern Tennessee. The circulation tries to get into Kentucky, finds itself over the Ohio River, possibly somewhere in Indiana and Illinois. I know that box jumps around a bit here, but this, this could make this turn where the center of circulation, what's left of it, it's a remnant weak system at this point, makes it all the way to Indiana and Illinois. And we see that maybe finishing in parts of uh, you know, parts of Missouri. And that's all the, the impact of the system getting just tossed around the northern and eastern side of the deeper load that's coming out of Canada right now, digging into the central United States. Now, these models are not going to get the winds right, not even close, and they're not designed to. But this is the wind field expected over the next seven days. So I want to point out, there is a deep low forming off the northwest coast as well. Could have some very strong winds there to British Columbia. We are expecting some strong and gusty winds to develop in the northern plains in the next seven days as well. But if we just take a moment and kind of zoom in here to the southeast, 
This is the European model solution. What I'm concerned about is the trajectory of the winds running perpendicular to the spine of the Appalachian Mountains here in Western North Carolina. And this is where I'm expecting the greatest flooding from this system once it makes itself much farther inland. I think the potential there for five, six, maybe up to 10 inches of rain is possible. We'll look at the models in a few moments. Here's the GFS solution. The GFS, in my opinion, tends to just be a windier model. And you can see now, same seven day forecast, but strong offshore winds, much stronger winds getting into Southern Canada throughout the Canadian Prairie and here in the Northern Plains as well. But let's focus in again on the Southeast. And we can see here that they're expecting wind gusts out of the GFS model pushing into Georgia and South Carolina that it could be gusting 70 to 80 miles an hour out of the system. I think this would be the high end, but we have to be aware that the models are potentially forecasting winds of that strength. It does have the hurricane hitting right here as a landfall position. So just wanted to keep you aware of, of what we're seeing here. Because of all of this, we've seen the all hazards weather map um, now start to put out there the hurricane watches. This is all about timing. So when it gets within 48 hours, we'll upgrade these to hurricane warnings. But as it stands, we have the hurricane watch in place here. There's tropical storm watches, also flood watches that are being posted. And I think a lot of what's going to be happening over the next 48 hours will be a focus in the Southern Plains, excuse me, in the Southeastern United States uh, with, uh, with respect to what this hurricane, which we'll get the name Helene is going to do. I was thinking about the Southern Plains because of the fog that's here right now. And also this part of Montana, which has got uh, the high wind uh, advisory out or high wind watch that's out today. All right, the interaction is interesting. And from a meteorological perspective, I, I hope you find this interesting. Those strong winds I showed you bringing that cloud field down, that's coming to the backside of this low. And this is tonight at seven o'clock where we expect uh, you know, tropical storm Helene, it'll likely have a name by then, will be sitting. Now what's interesting about the forecast, which we talked about yesterday, is the interaction between this low, which is cut off from the flow. So what do I mean when I say cut off? If you just kind of follow the, the height lines, we're doing this, right? And a couple of them come down and make a closed circulation here. So the flow is cut off from the main branch of the jet stream, and therefore it completes uh, a low, rather than keeping an open trough like this one, or this one, or this one, or this one. It's now a closed low, and therefore it's gonna sit there and spin. And as it sits there and spins, what'll happen is it'll draw this system up and around. This one will curl around the backside, and they'll orbit one another. And this is what you've got. This is through Thursday. This is Thursday afternoon and evening. The artificial intelligence has a landfall about seven o'clock uh, central time, so eight o'clock east coast time uh, in Florida. And then the two lows, just watch, they, they kind of you know orbit one another. Now eventually the tropical system will lose to the strength and size of the extra tropical system. But by Saturday, this is Saturday early morning, this is where the combined systems will be. Now don't be thinking about this as like they've combined strength and now they're just one massive super warrior storm. No. One has absorbed the other, and they're both actually in a weakening state at this point. But there's going to be clouds, and there's going to be rain. And the upper level flow is coming over the top, way up here like this. And so there's nothing to push this out of the way. See that? There's no flow. It's just all sitting here and spinning. This is Saturday. So it's there on Sunday. It's there a bit on Monday. It's still sitting over the Ohio Valley. And it's not until Monday into Tuesday that this wave develops and takes what's left of this thing and kicks it over here into the uh, East Coast. And that's why the week two forecasts for the East Coast do look a little bit wetter. We're just getting rid of this system. Now, after all of this, I'm going to show you some moisture, but after all of this, we get into this pattern that favors these West Coast troughs and Northeast troughs. And look, a Bering Sea still at it. We're going to talk more about that at the end of this video. And what I'm watching here is there could be some cold air. That's October 2nd on the backside of this. And the atmosphere just keeps wanting to get itself into this configuration where it just dumps troughs of low pressure here and you get a reflection of that in the Great Lakes, which means we could have a couple of time periods in early October that the Great Lakes get some cold air in place. So we'll show you more about that in a few minutes. What I'd like to do next though is walk through our precipitation forecasts. So this is the newest update from the artificial intelligence. Since we've been looking at its forecast, Here's what you've got. Now, most of the rest of the country for the next seven days, except here in the Northwest and in British Columbia, 
we're dry. Just not a whole lot going on here in the forecast. But I would like to take this and zoom on in here into the southeast so you can now see how much we've increased that flooding threat here along the Appalachian Mountains. Now that's the AI forecast. You can see just total precip over the next seven days. This is the WPC. Broader view first. I'm just going to take you down here. We'll switch US to Southeast. I'm still building all of the HTML so you can see all of this plus seven different regions around the world. But now we've got this wider stripe in here that the models are putting down. Take a look at my color bar and look at the numbers. Seems to be pretty widespread. Six, seven, eight inches of rainfall, heaviest rain. You know, the WPC's got it here. And then we see along the Appalachian Mountains, this would be, of course, the east facing slope, seven to 10 inches of rain. Let's keep going through the models. This is the national blend of models. If we take off my timestamp at the very end here, this is just how I ensure that you get the latest graphic and put this over to Southeast. Again, that's the NBM version of this. And remember, this is still bringing a lot of rain into parts of Kentucky, Tennessee, you know, Indiana. I mean, this is critical to get this rain on the Ohio River on this part of the Mississippi and the southern Mississippi, maybe even a little bit on the end of the Missouri. Rainfall totals are pretty high here with this. Let's now go to the um, high res. I think I can change this without getting rid of the timestamp. Let's try that again. SE. Oh, good, I can. So now what you see here, boy, the, the European model also has a lot of flooding rain in eastern Kentucky and Tennessee, in addition to the Appalachian Mountains and northern Georgia. It's even got a stripe in through parts of southern Missouri that's looking at six to seven inches. Again, we're just comparing models here. I, I, I can't tell you exactly. I'm just going to say this whole corridor, I mean, everywhere in, in between, very wet, it's extremely wet, major flooding threat. Uh, what about the European Ensemble? Just a broader view here. We won't zoom in on this one, but you can still see very similar forecast. This is the GFS. I would like to zoom in on the GFS, though. And just to get the numbers out of the GFS, just have a close look here. Very similar, actually, to the European model on the heavier rains here. And then this corridor, although the GFS is lighter, but I think the GFS resolution, it's a lower resolution model. I think it struggles with the Appalachian Mountains. But boy, look at this. This is great. You can see that right in through here, we've got lower precipitation totals. This is all because of the influence that the Appalachian Mountains are going to have, giving you almost a reverse rain shadow effect on this. That's really neat to see here in the forecast models. Doesn't take away from the devastating amount of flooding, but you can just see the context here. And finally, this is the GFS ensemble. That is, I don't know how many different models we looked at here, but five, five or six, and they all have the kind of the same, the same look at this system. Okay, next, just to put this all into context, the really the only event going on right now is going to be that tropical system and the cutoff low. You know, the, the rest of the country has got a drier forecast. The flow is going to be, you know, mainly due to deeper troughs that are digging into the northwest. That's why British Columbia is so wet. But outside of that, we're pretty dry over the next seven days, according to the models. And what's important about this is just to broaden this back out and remember that over the last 14 days, yes, we had the flow that came through like this, talked a lot about that, that got into the Canadian prairie. We then had uh, the system that came out of California, rolled around the ridge that was in Texas and provided the rain that came through here. And it's still trying to rain this morning through parts of Illinois and Indiana. We'll show you that again in a few seconds. But over the last 30 days, we saw drought expansion, which we talked about in yesterday's video and also on Friday. So this just makes a point that where some of this really heavy rainfall is going to be going through, like this corridor, it's we've had rapid drought expansion in that area. We're going to be providing rain into a place here that's been quite dry as well. So it's important to see that we're going to be taking some places which have been extremely dry for the last 30 days and really start to bring in quite a bit of moisture. What really changed from last week's forecast to this week's is that originally before we knew the timing of that trough that's going to dig down causing um, the hurricane to kind of curl around like this. Um, it looked as though this was just going to go right up the east coast, kind of helping to work against the longer standing drought in the northeast. But uh, overall, I think we now have a much better conclusion on where this is going to be. So that's what I've got for you. I, 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 I'm not going to add anything to it, but we certainly didn't subtract anything. We'll keep watching it. You need to keep watching it. Your resource, if you don't feel comfortable with digging deeper into websites like mine, agweather.com, 
just go to the National Hurricane Center, nhc.noaa.gov. Rely on them. They're going to be the most straightforward with the science and stay away from the hype. You're going to hear a lot of, there's going to be a lot of hype built about this over the next few days. We just need to be extremely careful with the way we consume that information, okay? So what else do we have going on? Let's blow this up and take a look this morning. Let's refresh that. I looked this morning at uh, radar. So this started late last night and is working its way through whatever, what is it, about six, seven o'clock in the morning this morning. So we had some nice moisture that moved through parts of Nebraska. Not much. There's not much here, but it did rain. This is the frontal boundary that's associated with that deeper trough that's digging. Much, much needed to rain that's moving through parts of the eastern Corn Belt. This is widely scattered. This is not widely spread. Does that make sense? We're just getting some areas get hit with some good rains, but not the soaking rain that the entire area needs. Some of this uh, was producing some lightning. Let's close that ad. Sorry about that. And uh, some of it was right over my house. And so it was, I... I don't know about you all, but I sleep like a baby during thunderstorms, and I did not want to wake up early this morning. I live right underneath all these lightning strikes here. But you can see movement through Kentucky, out of Tennessee, into Ohio, definitely some good uh, lightning strikes. And I know you, my mic's probably not picking up the thunder outside right now because I'm deep in my basement here recording, but a beautiful storm this morning. Um, so from there, I do need to point out that we still have to talk about the rainfall that's ahead of this. So using the high-res NAM this morning, we watched that low curl up. And it's just going to press into parts of the Great Lakes, Ontario, Quebec. We're going to see better chances of rain all out ahead of Helene in this area. And you're going to watch a frontal boundary that's going to come into the Pacific Northwest by the time we get into Wednesday midday to the afternoon hours. And then by the time we get into Wednesday evening, this is the broad rain and cloud shield that will already be well ahead of Helene. Helene is not even in the model domain yet by the time we get to 9 p.m. on Wednesday evening. But it will show up. So this is why the flood threat is going to be very high out of this system. And this is the high-res NAMS view of this system as it gets out there to Thursday at 1 o'clock. All right. So beyond this, let's just remember the overall pattern. The overall pattern has been one where it's coming out of the Bering Sea, we've delivered low pressure into, these are troughs of low pressure into the Gulf of Alaska, and they've been repeatedly diving into parts of the western side of North America. The next one's coming in here. Okay, There's a front that'll come through the Pacific Northwest, but the flow is largely coming through British Columbia. And that's what's supporting more often than not troughs that are trying to, like the one now curling up here or curling up over the Great Lakes. So I say all of that. So as you look at the week two forecasts, you all see that there's kind of a wet corner in the northwest, right, in the models here. But the mid part of the country is dry. Why? The flow comes in like this. That's out of Canada. That's northwest flow in fall, which is dry. And these lows are curling up here. So we have dry swath of air still in place out there for week two. Now, at some point, this is also going to drive in some cooler air. And while the frost threat over the next seven days is primarily in the western mountains, we do have to start having these conversations about when that colder air is going to get back into place. So today, <clears throat> this is what our high temperatures look like. Very hot at low elevation in the west. Very hot in the southeast ahead of this. All the cool weather you saw in the midsection of the country was cloud cover driven. Tomorrow on Wednesday, getting into Thursday, this is now cooling off because of the, the rain. And we see the heat back in the western Dakotas. Again, good 65 degree swing in temperatures here if you look back to this past weekend when it was quite cold. We then get into Friday and Saturday. Remember, this is when we expect the low to be curling up, combining with the upper level low sitting here. Just widespread cloud cover. And by the time we get into Sunday, there is a weaker front that moves through the northwest again. But overall, these are your temperatures for the next seven days. Okay, beyond that, what I'm going to be watching carefully is in some of the forecast models, whoops, we are keeping an eye out on some colder air. Now, you can get all of these on agweather.com. I'm going to play through the next several days quickly because we've already seen them. What I'm concerned about here is, there we go, September 30th and October 1st, whoops, right there, that's 7 a.m. We see this cooler air advancing. Why? There's a trough here. And a complementary trough there so the flow is going around and up and down like this all right so <clears throat> we are out there on october 1. this is now early in the morning ah, early in the morning on october 2. see the colder air darn it i went to straight to october 3rd i apologize for that that is in the morning on october 2nd 
and you can see the much cold air of 40s. This is going to be dry and cool air coming in here. And we see that this, again, colder air penetrating into the Great Lakes. You can definitely see it in the west. Why? That trough now moves. Why? This one moved. It all just kind of continues. And by 7 a.m. on October 3rd, some cold air working its way into Ontario and eventually over into eastern Canada. That's my next potential threat for some frost. And you can imagine this trough has to go somewhere. So it ends up showing up all throughout the west on the morning of Friday, October 4th. And then it's going to eventually, see it right there, sorry, that gets out into the high plains and western plains with another frost event on October 5th. And then that eventually, there we go, tries to on the 6th to get into this area with some colder air. So what I'm saying is even though all these long range forecasts show mild, there are just interludes of colder air in between the warm ups. So let's look at them again. European across the top, GFS across the bottom. What you've got here is, um, you know, much mild conditions here. Then the cooler weather, which I just talked about. And day 10 through 15, we still see the influence of the deeper troughs in the Gulf of Alaska. From there, I do want to get back into bigger picture pattern things to just kind of round this forecast out and look longer term. The West Pacific Oscillation is coming off its peak. It's going to temporarily at the beginning of the month drop back down to normal. But some of the forecast models, again, bring it back up. And you're going, what does that mean? That is where we get in the Bering Sea low pressure forming that sends troughs into the Gulf of Alaska. So you look at the forecast here from the European Extended. And what we end up getting here is that early October multiple times in early October. We went through the first week. Here's the second week of October. And then by the time we get into the third week, it begins to wash it out. But the Bering Sea sending troughs of low pressure here tend to result in other troughs of low pressure there. So the flow comes in and then runs over a ridge and then comes back out like this. So this is giving us better chances of getting some cooler air at times in this area, followed by quick warm ups. So I don't think you can say anything other than October temperatures to tell you that it's going to be one of those Octobers that the temperatures go up, down, up, down, weak, warm, cold, week, weak, warm, week, cold, week. I think that's what we're going to see. But the problem is when you look at the whole time period together over the like a 30 day window, <clears throat> if I can get this to load. Yeah, you're like, uh, show me all of October. You see more mild than anything. And that's, that's just when you average it all out, maybe the warmer days are warmer than the colder days are colder. Does that make sense? But it also says this, that pattern is not a wet one. And that's why you see mostly a drier forecast for October. And I'm just going to say it again. If the troughs dig in here, the flow comes into British Columbia. A lot of ridging in this area. That's why you see so dry down here. But this, is, this will bust in an instant if we get another tropical system out of the Gulf or out of the uh, Caribbean. So let's just be clear on what's possible there. I still think more of this pattern is being dominated by the MJO than anything else. It's moved back over Africa. It's over here in phase one, or it's sticking way out there in the middle of the Pacific. And it's expected to collapse and maybe show back up in phase four or five. In the meantime, though, I think we're going to get the results of the MJO phase one. I've now shown you this for four straight videos. I just think we continue to see the WPO making lows here, the MJO helping them show up there. Some sort of ridging in this area. There's your reflection trough that sits over the Great Lakes. This just makes a ton of sense to me, but sometimes I try to you know, find the things that make sense to explain them. The reality of it is, is that I don't have a tremendous amount of confidence in what the rest of October is going to look like, even though the models keep doing this. They're saying a lot of heat. Look at the week three, week four. Your troughs are here and here. So the flow comes around and over and dives. <clears throat> and you just keep seeing that in the forecast models. And what that also does, that flow out of the Northwest is very dry in the central United States. To finish all of this up, I want to give you one new long range forecast. This is the last one I was waiting on. It comes from the Japanese. Now the maps, uh, they're a bit complicated if you're not used to looking at them, but the Japanese for the next three months continuing to show La Nina developing. They've got <clears throat> stronger trade winds. They've also got the MJO trying to live in phase four, phase five. So one is over here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one. See that? So it's a lot of phase four and phase five right there in the middle. And what makes sense to me about that is that that's a very common phase if you also get the influence of a La Nina. And we, we have that. We have the influence of a La Nina. So during November to January, we tend to find that when there's a La Nina, our MJO likes to live right in through here. 
Now, what do we do with any of that? Well, what that means is we tend to get, if the MJ was here, our fastest winds leaving Japan, but not continuing. Do you remember last year, all we talked about was the flow leaving Japan and not stopping before it got to the West Coast? Not this year. This indicates during winter, very weak subtropical jet stream flow. This indicates flow that will likely come into the Northwest and leave through the Ohio Valley. That's what La Niña's typically do to the jet stream level winds. Now, <clears throat> if it was an MJO, or excuse me, if it wasn't La Niña, we would expect the opposite of this. We'd expect weaker winds aloft and much stronger subtropical flow, but that's not what we've got. And that's one of the reasons why our winter temperature pattern is so mild across the south and maybe up the east coast. This is December, January, February. When we don't have uh, you know, the, the, the right setup just to deliver knockout punches of cold air in this area, eh, we tend to be more mild. But we expect more variable North Pacific jet, which is why the northern tier of the U.S. and the Midwest at times will have multiple cold air intrusions. And by the way, I expect some of them to get all the way down to Texas and the Gulf Coast. That happens every winter. I think we're going to get more of those, of course, than we saw last winter. Precipitation-wise, without a strong subtropical jet, the fall tends to be drier. Central Plains, it tends to spread across the southeast with time. And the jet stream tends to enter the northwest and leave like this, which is why the Ohio Valley and the Pacific Northwest almost always are favored on the wetter side of things. So I'm just kind of trying to bring this whole narrative uh, together for us. Where I want to finish is with a quick look at some global things. So remember on agweather.com, right on the main page when you land there, just slide over here, click on 10 day global, and you'll be taken to these two maps. Let's look at the precipitation side of things. Still very wet in Australia. Why? MJO reset. We're expecting to have good flow out of the Northwest. And as a result, quite a bit of precip here. We also see that um, there are tropical systems out here curling around the Bermuda High, which are here. And that's actually influencing the precipitation patterns into Europe. Overall, South America is still very dry, um, but we have very wet conditions in southern Brazil. And if you just look at the next 14 days in South America, no early start to the monsoon is being projected for the beginning of October. Still don't see it. Even though, as you know from yesterday's analysis, I still think there's plenty of moisture. It just has to get pulled in. The flow has to start to pull this in, and we're not there yet. But flooding continues down into southern Brazil, particularly Uruguay and Rio Grande do Sul. The newest forecast from the European model has once again kind of dried out. Now, it's not really dry. There's still wetter conditions here in Mato Grosso and Pata, but we have broader areas that are showing up a bit drier in the forecast we can't ignore. And the reason why I bring this up is, I mean, I'll just take you back to, I don't know, let's go five model runs ago. The models were much wetter in this area. And what we've seen is a drying trend in the European model from um, run five days ago, which I showed you last week, versus one this week. So let's just keep an eye on it. I think there could be some slow planting at the beginning of October, which if the rains come in mid to late October, they will very rapidly begin their planting. So let's keep an eye on it together. And uh, we'll just talk again in the morning. Appreciate it. Thank you.